What's up, Algebra 1? We are 30 minutes away from kickoff, and I want to go ahead and shoot you a video for how the homework works tonight. Let's start with number 15. We've got distribution. Negative 8 needs to multiply by 4 to give you negative 32x. Let's multiply negative times a negative to get positive 24. And some of you guys may have already made it past this screen, but I want to make sure everybody understands how this works first because it's key to understanding how distribution works as well as how combining like terms works. Negative 9 times 9, negative 81. Negative times a negative is positive, and then I think 9 times 8 is 72 with an n there. Let's keep multiplying. 7 times n is 7n, and 7 times 5 is 35. So now I'm looking at numbers that should be combined. 72n and 7n are like terms. 70 9 in, and then we have negative 81 plus 35, that is negative 46. And we're going to stop right there because this is an expression. You cannot combine like terms if they have different types of variables or one is a constant. Okay, so I think I want to go ahead and skip to problems that were assigned, starting with number 20. Having lost your cell phone, your grandparents are making you pay for your own. You find a phone where the monthly fee is $18. That's one time, one time payment of $18. Now the text messaging is free and you're charged 12 cents. So that number is actually a word. So you got to pay close attention to that. So that is plus 0.12 per M. And it says if your bill for the first month is equals 29.52, how many minutes did you use for our calls? So you had to read that and really put together our expression slash equation because it was supposed to equal 29.52. So let's go ahead and take off the fact that you spent $18 on your phone. So we can just see what it costs for simply the text messages. So if I'm kind of subtracting those two, 29 minus 18 is 11, and then you have 52 cents left over. Let's go ahead and divide that 0.12 over to the other side. And so I think that's merit, uh, that merits a calculator. So let's do 11.52, and let's divide that by 12, not 12, but actually 0.12, and that gives us 96. So that means that you must have spent 96 minutes on the phone that month in order to have 29.52 as the cost. So we got to read really carefully and think about which part is just a single value, a one-time idea, and then the other one is a per minute idea, and so we need a variable with that. And so once we set it up with a total, we can solve and figure out what that's going to be. For the next one, it says find x such that both rectangles have the same perimeter. So in class, I went ahead and labeled the outside values like a rectangle as the opposite sides are the same. 2x minus 1, 2x minus 1, 3 and 3. Over here, we have x plus 4 and x plus 4, and we also have 7 and 7. So let's go ahead and see if we were adding this whole perimeter up and adding this whole perimeter up, what would make them equal? So, 2x plus 2x is 4x. 3 minus 1 is 2. Plus 3 is 5. Minus another one is 4. So that means if you add this whole perimeter up, you're getting 4x plus 4. If we do the other one, x plus x is 2x. And 4 plus 4 is 8. Plus 7, that's 15 plus seven more, that is 22. So now the question is, is what x value makes these perimeters the same? So let's go ahead and combine some like terms and see what we got. Subtract two from the right side to the left side and you get two x plus four equals 22. Scroll down a little bit to get some room. Let's subtract four to the other side. So I'm, I'm basically combining like terms. I'm putting the x's on the left I'm putting the constants on the right, and you get 2x equals 18. Let's go ahead and divide that 2 over, because in, in algebra, when you see 2x and they're against each other, that really means multiplication. So what we're seeing here is like 2 times what number is 18, and that x value must be 9. So if you were to plug in 9 for your expression, 
for both rectangles, you would see that their perimeter is equal when x is 9. Go ahead and try it, and tomorrow we'll talk about what the perimeter actually is when you plug in 9. The school is thinking about putting shade trees in the courtyard, and two choices are oak trees and willow trees. Now, this word initial can be difficult, but another word for initial is beginning. The beginning height of the tree and its yearly growth are given at a table to the right, and really it's below, but you know what I mean. After how many years would the two trees be the same? So when you're talking about initial height, we don't need a variable there. But here we probably would need a variable because it means that you're adding one foot a year. Or for the second one, we're adding two feet per year. So let's talk about the oak tree first. Basically, it's starting at eight feet and you're adding one X per year or one foot per year. So if you plug in one, the first year is nine. You plug in two, the second year it's 10 and so forth. But I want to know when will that equal this other one that actually starts at a lower height of three, but it's actually growing faster than the first one. It's growing at two feet per year. So after the first year, it'll be five. And after that next year, it'll be seven and so forth and so forth. So using our table, we're able to start, start an equation. And so let's kind of do the same thing we did on the other problem. Combine like terms. 8 equals 3 plus 1x. 2 minus 1 is 1. And let's subtract 3. And basically, x must be 5. So let's think about it. If you started at 8 feet for the first tree, and then you grew 1 foot for 5 years, basically, not, not plus 5, but let's say it was 5 feet. Basically, after 5 years, this is 13 feet tall. Well, if the second tree starts at 3, and it's growing at 2 feet per year, 2 times 5 years worth would be 10, plus the original 3, again, 13 feet. So that's what makes the height the same after 5 years of growth. And we use the basic ideas about initial height and yearly growth, where yearly growth should have a variable with its coefficient, 1x on the left and 2x on the right. Solving that, and we get 5. We took this one off because Mr. Turner made some mistakes when he made that. But let's jump to the next part where we're talking about inequality graphs. With this one, we pay close attention to the fact that they tried to tried to fill that in. It's kind of hard to see on your worksheet, but if you look at the other ones, you can tell that it's more open on those versus kind of filled in on that. So I'm sorry if that's kind of challenging to see with my printer. I'm sorry about that. But basically when I'm looking at this, it looks like all the values that are shaded are greater than or equal to negative two. But for this one, it looks like all the values are less than negative 6, and that open dot basically represents that x can't actually equal negative 6. It is simply less than negative 6. Similarly, we have some open dots here, but all of our values are between them. So we've been talking about compound inequalities and how useful they can be in programming. And so basically, all of our values, which we'll call x, are trapped between negative 2, but not equal to, because it's not filled in, or they are uh, less than 3. So we're basically trapped. They're greater than negative 2, but they're less than 3. And so it has to be between those. And this is the way that we write that using algebra. Looking at the other one, this is an or problem. So basically, either x is less than negative 3, that's what this means, or x is greater than 6. Both of these have an open circle, and that's why I do not have an or equal line under those inequalities. So let's talk about solving for a moment. When you're trying to solve, you should always try to start with distribution if you see it, or start combining like terms on a side as you see that as well. So let me move that down. So on the left, I'm going to start with thinking about distribution. But this 4x is not being uh, used at first, so I just kind of want to drop that down. Negative 3 times 5 is negative 15. 
and a negative times a negative is a positive, 3 times 2x is 6x equals 13 minus 8x. On the left, it seems like I have like terms. 4x plus 6x is 10x, but the minus 15 doesn't have a like term, so I don't want to lose that. I'm going to drop it down. And on the right side, I have 13 minus 8x. Didn't do anything with that. So now I have to kind of switch some stuff around because like terms aren't on the same side. So I think I'm going to add 8x to the other side to get 10, uh, sorry, 18x minus 15 equals 13. Let's go ahead and think about putting the constants on the other side. Let's add 15 from the left to the right, and you get 18x equals 28. Let's divide the 28 to the other side, and no, you didn't make a mistake because you didn't get an integer, but we are getting closer to the test, and I don't want us to always think everything is a whole number or an integer. And so this one can actually reduce. They're both divisible by 2. So let's divide this number by 2 to get 14. Let's divide this number by 2 to get 9. So basically your answer is 14 ninths, and that's okay. Sometimes your answer is a decimal. So I would like for you to try this one independently using a very similar idea. To get you started, I think I would suggest that you multiply negative 3 throughout that parentheses, and that's called distribution. And I would also consider combining like terms on the left so that you can clean that side up a little bit. So for 34 and 35, I want to go ahead and tell you that these are special cases. Special cases mean you may or may not get the answer that you're expecting. So let's kind of take a look at that and see what I mean. On the left, I'm not really doing anything because these aren't really like terms. However, on the right, we need to start by distributing. 3 times 2b is 6b. 3 times negative 8 is negative 24. And then we have this plus 5. As I'm rewriting the left side, I'm thinking about the right side and thinking about how these could go together. 6b doesn't change. But negative 24 plus 5 is negative 19. So I'm starting to think something's weird because 6b is on both sides. And if I was to subtract, if I were to subtract, sorry, if I was to subtract those, negative 7 equals negative 19, which is not true. And I've lost my variable, so there must be something wrong. And any time this happens and it's not true, the answer is no solution. Not every equation has a solution, and so when you lose those variables at the end and the numbers don't match, we know that we're in a no solution situation. So if you know about algebra classes from middle school, you know the opposite of no solution may be all solutions. So let's kind of explore 35 and see what makes that an all solutions problem. 5x is not really being written. Uh, sorry, 5x is not really being used, but I do need to distribute 3 times 2x to make 6x, and 3 times negative 7 to be negative 21. That's all I can really do on the left as I'm writing left to right. I see that negative 10 minus 11 is negative 21, and I still want that 11x because nothing really happened with it. As I move to the next line, I think, well, those are like terms, and that's 11x minus 21. Well, that happens to equal the exact same thing on the right, so now I'm starting to be suspicious about what's going on. As I subtract 11x from the right to the left, what happens is, is I'm left with negative 21 equals negative 21, and that is radically different from this one because this is actually true. These numbers are the same. And so this is what I mean by all solutions. You could also say that's infinitely many solutions. That's the same thing. So I want you to go ahead and try these other last problems on your own, and we'll check those on your uh, paper tomorrow. Remember the last two were bonus, and if you remember the idea of cross multiplication, give that a shot. Uh, otherwise, I will see you tomorrow. Good luck, and thank you for watching the video.